Hello. In this episode of Airs for Architecture, I speak with Dana Cuff, Professor of Architecture and Urban Design and founder of City Lab at UCLA. We speak about her 2023 book, Architectures of Spatial Justice, published by MIT Press. A is for Architecture, a podcast about architecture, buildings, urban culture and space. Hello and welcome to another episode of Ayers for Architecture. I'm talking today to Dana Cuff, um, Professor of Architecture at UCLA. Dana, would you like to expand on that introduction? <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to Ayers for Architecture. Uh, yeah, let's see. I teach architecture I also have an appointment in urban planning at UCLA. I'm the director of a design research center uh, called City Lab here at UCLA. And I run a program called the Urban Humanities Initiative, which um, is the kind of pedagogical alternative to the modern university. So I have a PhD in architecture from UC Berkeley and an undergraduate degree in psychology and design. I made up design major because they didn't have it uh, where I was studying. And um, together, those seem like maybe the best way to get to architecture, I could imagine, between some kind of human study and uh, artistic study. To quote Blaise so Pascal, that, that imagination the disposes of everything, initiative. creates How does beauty, that justice and happiness, which is everything in it's this world. It's a graduate world. program Look and see in Dan's great that lasts a full year. So. You Thanks take to her it in for the conversation to and to MIT Press for the book. UCLA, Links to it and to Dana's social and professional profiles are in the podcast description, as always. By the Mellon Thanks for listening. Foundation. Uh, and it brings together architecture planning and the humanities to uh, work on social justice initiatives and give uh, graduate students new methods to do impactful um, and engaged research. I see. So sort of not desk-based action research. Yeah, that's right. And that's why I think of it as being part of the emerging university that really our old ideas, which has really, I think, um, disadvantaged architecture of keeping one discipline separated from another is completely inappropriate for addressing the biggest problems in the world today. There's still this amazing, luxurious, uh, scholarly focus that everyone should be able to have in the university, but that isn't enough today in my mind. No. I think that's one of the things that I've slowly discovered that architecture and architects assume because their discipline is very broad based that they are yeah. inherently inevitably interdisciplinary and it's not really true in practice very uh, well certainly not in academia yeah that's a good distinction to make i think when you get into practice you're called upon to be much broader in scope than we tend to think of the academic discipline of architecture, which, you know, went through this autonomous period in the 80s and 90s, where we were really trying to focus on our own discipline and trying to see what strength we could build from within. Mm -hmm. I think that's a tired uh, project now, but it probably served us well as a basis for developing the current you know, movement or school of thought in architecture. Uh, and what's the and what's the relationship between your urban humanities initiative and and the um the design the city lab uh, uh-huh. at CLA? Because does that yeah. have a do that do they feed each other? Yes, they're like um, twins uh, joined at the hip. So we really started with city lab in two thousand six after Hurricane Katrina in the United States, in the Gulf Coast, where the whole region was wiped out, Mm -hmm. there was a very inadequate response from architects. A bunch of postmodernists raced down to the Gulf Coast region and uh, redesigned um, the Kmarts and the Walmarts and the 7-Elevens in a more uh, New Orleans style or something like that, when really there was this huge economic and political and environmental crisis that had occurred, let alone the sort of displacement of all the people, particularly in underserved, marginalized Black communities, where the flooding really decimated the communities. So seeing that, 
we decided uh, here at UCLA, my colleague Roger Sherman and I decided we should start a way to respond to those kinds of crises. Uh, you know, Los Angeles is also the center of catastrophe in literature and film and novels. So, you know, so it seemed a reasonable thing to use a catastrophe to leverage the work we were going to try to do here uh, as a research center. So, you know, that's now 16, 17 years old. Um, we then realized UCLA is pretty remote from the action of Los Angeles. We're uh, in a kind of suburban, white, upper middle class neighborhood, uh, 10 miles from downtown where Los Angeles really began as Mexico and mm -hmm. as a Pueblo, um, and where the, there's still this really incredibly diverse city. So we, City Lab opened a second satellite off campus site and started working, you know, partly on campus, partly in the city. And then we realized just doing the research and projects and political impacts that we've had, um, wasn't the, exact it wasn't the best use of the university setting in which we were s situated that really we should be teaching this and and building our design research capacities by understanding better through pedagogy where the fields were going and how we might um use theory and history to better understand the impactful research we were doing and how that research might be fed back into our courses so that students could go forward with their own careers and practices and city labs at some level. And, and so urban humanities emerged as that. And it's been an incredible success in that we've graduated 250 urban humanists. They get a graduate certificate and they're doing some of the most amazing work around the country and and around the world, actually. And and so does this, I mean, you mentioned, I think in the book, you mentioned Rural Studio, Sam Mockby's um, Rural Studio. Yes. Um, yeah. Does that have power? I mean, the, obviously their program down at Auburn is to do with making, design and making, dealing, uh, I, I guess, addressing or encountering certainly some of the, some um, relatively similar issues around marginalization and race. Um, yeah. does your project, does, does co uh, the city lab, does it have this kind of active, uh, component like that, or is it much more academic still? No, it definitely is an active component. And I really think of Mockby's rural studio as a historic precursor for what we're trying to do at City Lab. They're very distinct. I think they're mm -hmm. very much of their era, you know, Mock B and of their geography. So Mock B was able to work in the rural South and build things out of uh, cutlass supreme windshields, you know, for uh, couples of people who were living pretty remotely and they're beautiful structures. And it was a way of showing that aesthetics could be democratized and there was a way that you could learn to make things with uh, ethics and principles in mind. So those kind of ideas uh, we carry on, but, you know, we're also in a mega city in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. We're not exactly going to go out and harvest refuse and build housing. I think that actually got rural studio in a little bit of complicated uh, situation also. And the new guy that's running it, I think it's Andrew Freer is doing really remarkable new work. But here, what we try to do is develop what we call demonstrations or prototypes. So we make, we, we don't ever do architecture projects. I try to make projects for architects and we're very careful not to take any projects from architects that, so we try to uh, kind of till the ground to develop new types of architectural work. Uh, this work we've done on secondary units is a kind of er example of that. So, you know, in, in the backyards, in the suburban context of Los Angeles, which is a context that you find all over the world, but especially in the Southwest of the United States, it's very low density 
underutilized capacity of mm-hmm. land, <laughs> extreme underutilization in the suburbs. So at City Lab, we studied all of that backyard condition, which nobody had ever really done before, looking at what types of lots there are, um, what kinds of building additions have been made that have transformed the original house on the front of the property and how that impacts what's going on in the back. And then we looked at endemic conversions that people are already doing. You know, there's like an informal industry Mm. of garage apartments and granny flats and secondary units. And we tried to see what people had done on their own, because there's a logic in that, that, you know, doesn't require new research. It's Mm. a study of an existing condition, kind of like Rudofsky or somebody, Mm. you know, looking at the informal building economies. So based on that, we developed a prototype full scale. Like we we tried to figure out like what could we build that would be environmentally sound, would fit on going down five foot side yard setbacks. You know, could we make an accordion like structure so that we could carry it down the sides of the house, pop it out onto a foundation, all that kind of uh thinking. But then and, and built a prototype, which gave us a kind of lever, design lever to say, you know, this is the way backyard housing could go. It could be environmentally sound. It could be lightweight. It could be practical. It could be beautiful. It doesn't have to be traditional. It doesn't have to follow the so-called character of the neighborhood. Architects can participate. Um, but then we wrote legislation for the state of California that I co-authored with my a uh, partner in crime whenever it comes to policy, Jane Blumenfeld, who speaks policy more readily than I do. Um, but we wrote legislation for the state that got passed, which potentially has 8 million secondary units capacity for building. And it ended single family zoning in the state of California. So, you know, that range is the range I'm looking for. Yeah. So that design is a lever, design research is the tool, and the outcome is to have a really big outcome that ends up producing work for architects and making a more socially just landscape. I see. This is we haven't really, worked most on housing, but this is a really interesting. This is a really interesting. This is the bi- the the buy home that 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 you're talking That's about. Right. Isn't it? Yeah, That's a very right. beautiful, very elegant thing, and I can see what you mean. Uh, in, in positioning your work as a sort of counterpoint to the rural studio idea, which, which, uh, as much as I love it and I do adore it and I think it's been amazing, um, if, if, if only for doing one of these, if uh, not only, but principally for generating recognition of a condition and a group of people who are, have hitherto for not been really served by architecture. But I was wondering, uh, I should say, I should say, I think it's probably time that we said we're, we're meeting today to talk about your, your book. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. We better get there. Architectures of Spatial Justice, which we published last year. Is that right? 2022. 2023, actually. It's this oh, year. It's, it's very it's current. Unbelievably yes. fresh. Unbelievably, yes. um, but yes. with MIT Press. And it's an amazing book. And, and when I saw it and I saw your name attached to it, I was, Super excited because I've actually read your work since 2007, 2008, 2007. I think I first came across your work. Um, so I was very, very excited and it's an amazing book, but I'm really interested in, in this distinction from say rural studio where, where you do have that. It's essentially traditional architecture. You've got people authoring individual units. They are unique. They're remarkable. They're beautiful. Um, incredibly clever and they do amazing things. But what you seem to be suggesting is that there is a kind of, and you mentioned uh, uh, Rudofsky. I wasn't going to do it. You did it. So I'm going to carry on with that. Um, <laughs> there is this kind of anonymity to what you're doing, which embeds the architecture as a sort of instrument of delivering policy. Is that kind of what it's trying to do? Is it, is it more interested in that? macro scale effect than the micro scale of the red line site. Well, that's a very interesting reading. 
I would say something slightly different, which is we, I think our most successful work leverages design so that the um, work of the architect is more equitably distributed and so that architecture serves some greater commons, some greater good. And the most effective way and the most unique way we've been able to do it, that I've been able to work, is to take it all the way through policy, is to generate prototypes. Some of them don't have policy implications. I can give you an example of that. But to develop a new type of building and use um, or architectural entity object that then stands as a prototype or a demonstration, opening doors for others to say, yes, that makes sense for us too. So that we don't do projects, we do these kind of initiatives. And some of those initiatives lead all the way up to state policy, but not all of them. Mm. That's a really... It's a different kind of architectural practice, that's for sure. So Mm. instead of making buildings, we make uh, demonstrations that lay out opportunities for buildings. And those opportunities are supposed to be, are are always intended to advance justice, to bend the conditions toward the world we want to live in. I like this idea of bending, bending the conditions. Um, I mean, this, this idea of justice, obviously the book is entitled that. Perhaps we could Perhaps you could talk about that a little bit. This, I mean, you mentioned Edward Soger's um, spatial justice, which your book jumps from, and that's obviously got. I, you know, there's a, there's been a whole literature in the second half of the twentieth century, but obviously going right back to the ancients around justice. Hmm. Um, perhaps you could tell us, like, how how are you approaching spatial justice? Like, how do we understand spatial yeah. justice? Well, it's Soja who I think first made the claim so directly that justice has geography. He was a geographer. He taught in the building across the way here at UCLA. He and I used to argue and, you know, drink a lot of coffee at the same time uh, because he never really uh, appreciated space in the way an architect might. Space mm-hmm. was a much more abstract concept to him. And I was always arguing, you know, no, you know, the material reality of space is an important dimension of your space because it's where we collectively find agreements in experience that we don't have to read about. We actually live them. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, the idea that he had of seeking spatial justice was one that could get pushed through an architectural lens and really add a whole new dimension to what he was interested in, which was things like the bus riders union, really important things, but not anything that we architects know what to do with. So, you know, when you talk to an architect and you say, yeah, we should have greater, you know, social equity. I mean, nobody says, no, no, we should keep things as unequal as possible. They, they're more likely to say, you know, Something like homelessness is an impossible condition. It's got so many factors. I don't think architecture has much to do with it. So it's that reasoning that motivated me to say, well, you can always say that, right? We can always say, how can I change the world when really it's all controlled by Halliburton and Amazon anyway? (laughs) So what's the notion of spatial justice that an architect can um what what tools do we have as architects to touch upon spatial justice in ways that make some change possible however small Mm. and you know those are the kinds of questions then that uh, motivated the book and that motivated city lab in in the end i Mm. mean that's why we started city lab was because i wanted to see if I could do it, not just write about it. Mm. <laughs> and it's been an amazing laboratory for me to mm. test my theoretical and historical understandings to what I really think of as 
a set of minor literatures through architecture that could be woven together to thinking about a different dimension that is already existing in architecture. And I guess this is the, you know, distinction that I also would make between say my work and that of anybody who's a utopianist or, you know, a world maker kind of thinker is that uh, I actually think this kind of work's already going on. It's just that we've repressed our uh, acknowledgement of it in architecture. We think of it as building or, you know, done by somebody else, or we don't call it architecture per se. Um, and it's also just going on in little pockets all around the world. And so it's um, important for us to bring those threads together, which is what the book tries to do, to show that it's a real path that's being carved out and it needs more adherence. It doesn't need to have everyone be an adherent, but it needs young people like, I don't know, all the students who come in these days who, you know, are worried about climate change, worried. I mean, they feel like their lives depend upon a focus on climate change. And another group of students who say the same thing about social justice. So how do we, empower them to work towards world changing practices yeah you use this phrase leveraging and you've used it already here mm -hmm. yeah. i'd quite like to understand that a little bit, bit better design i think can perhaps be seen as something rather and this is very much i think a, a postmodern tendency um or a late modern tendency uh as as a sort of an ornament and a privilege of the privileged. Right. And your idea about design, and I got this from another, I was talking to Catherine Ingram, who's over, yeah. At, yeah, who's over at Pratt, this idea of the, the ordinariness of design as an activity. And, and I think this is what you're talking about. There's this kind of anonymity. Probably the majority of architectural and spatial development is anonymous. It's not something that is heroic. It's not something that gets glossy pictures. And I was just wondering, like, how are we defining design in this sense? We're not talking about people sitting down with, you know, tracing paper and 2B pencils or whatever. I don't know if you have 2B and HB pencils in America. Maybe not 2B, but we have H. Oh, yes, sure we do. But yeah. nobody uses them anymore. I'm sure my students don't know what a 2B. I thought you were saying T-U-B-I, there was some brand of pencil. No, no, no. I was just wondering whether there was a different measurement technique for softness yeah. of like pencil. Two but anyway, B, it's four not H, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not that that we're talking about, is it? It's something something other, something that derives from a kind of, well, you, you, you tell me. I, I want to keep, I want to keep design in the 2B, 2H, uh, you know, rhino systems in play. I, I don't, I'm not willing to let those go. So to me, um, it's in service of other than privilege. It's in fact in service of undermining privilege, the kind of work that I do. But I think that we, when I'm talking about leveraging design, it's leveraging architectural practices and techniques and materials at the highest level possible, because it's even harder to solve the ordinary problems than it is to solve the ones that come with tons of money and convention already established and, you know, well-worn paths that you follow. Mm -hmm. So I am, I might have a different set of partners and collaborators and stakeholders that we do at City Lab and we do in the urban humanities, but we want to take, and I use leverage a lot because I think that's the main tool that I'm working with all the time as an academic. I mean, my center's in a university, so I'm always sort of steeped in pedagogy and training. Um, if I'm training the next generation of architects, I want them to use the highest skills they've got towards a different outcome mm. with a different set of partners. But I, I'm not, uh, I'm not 
I, I admire people who work in everyday life contexts, say with um, auto construction or DIY, but that's not where we're working. We're really mm-hmm. working with, you know, I don't know, all the pleasures and um, aesthetic joy that architecture can bring yeah. and try to distribute that differently. And that distribute that project. Distrib- yeah, that distribution requires a change in the process of architectural production. Design yes. is. Yes. I, tell me about that. I mean, what? I mean, I think we yeah. understand. <laughs> well, some people would say that you need to uh, undermine uh, racial capitalism in order to achieve what I'm talking about, and that would be one way. But that's not a way I know how to move forward. I, I don't. I can't put one foot in front of the other if what I have to do is undermine neoliberalism, for example. Though I do think it would be a worthy cause for, you know, my weekend protesting, for example. Mm. But as an architect, (laughs) as someone in architecture, what I'm going to do is try to pull out the kinds of threads that have been pushed aside in traditional architectural practice as it's evolved in the modern to current era. So for instance, who are the publics? Who is the public? What is the community that we think is the context within which our buildings sit today? Mm. You know, that's a really complicated question and an ethical one designing for whom means really thinking about that critically. So, you know, I think of architecture that is part of a spatial justice agenda as having something that you might call a radically public notion, meaning that it serves far beyond any clientele. Mm -hmm. It smuggles in a commons where uh, there might have just been something that was thought of as the street before. And that you work with that and design for that specifically and do that in a way that it lays out models for the next projects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it becomes a kind of a series of ideas about the process that Mm -hmm. all work together to really transform or disrupt in current tech lingo the way we've done things in the Mm -hmm. past. You've talked about, you talk about mutations of the process, uh-huh. Uh-huh. which I really like this idea that there are incremental moves that we can make. And this kind of come like is what you're talking about. This idea of, you know, who is my public? Well, if my public is the street and those who live on the street, which could be anybody yeah, in theory, and we can make one move on the entrance sequence of a building that, yeah improves visual access and visual amenity into the foyer of a building that would hitherto for been closed to the public. We've made a mutation and. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. So the first step is seeing that opportunity and being a good enough designer to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And possibly to be a good enough communicator and, uh, collaborator that you've generated that kind of idea from the other people around you who see things differently that you use and are creative with others like to co-create these kinds of things Mm -hmm. but then the next step in my mind that's step one then the next step of the process is how do I make sure this is visible to others who are coming along like okay if I just opened up the possibility of access through a visual corridor, something Mm -hmm. really small that doesn't seem very radical, but could in fact make a difference or have a new public in mind. Um, How do you show that that's what you've done? And so this goes on to thinking about like, can we make this a kind of what uh, Mexican counterparts of ours call legible policy? Uh, this came from the work of Gabriel Gomez Mont, who ran something called Laboratorio de la Ciudad, the exact city lab equivalent, but in Mexico City. And she 
really instigated this whole theory of legible policy, which now I'm trying to figure out how to make more systematic in the kind of example you give. Legible policy. So the idea Mm -hmm. that you can Mm -hmm. read through Mm -hmm. the physical infrastructure and physical space. Yeah. Like, can you make a stopping point? You know, okay, so legible policy in uh, Berlin might be those uh, stumble stones that are in the sidewalk that show where Jewish history took place in your everyday world. And you literally trip on these stones, which causes you to stop and think and give you some information. Um, you know, in J- Japanese gardens, there are something called borrowed landscapes. And often there's a point in a path in a garden where where you step has been complicated and you get to a landing point where you can look up. And it's at that point that you see the design composition. And so the way you actually move through space identifies what it is you're seeing and enables your seeing, for example. Mm. Yeah. So that's just one, just direct physical means. I mean, for us, there's the other means, which is you publish about it. You say what you've done. You share it. You make it open source. You, <laughs> um, and, you the, and, then, and, and then you do things like you transpose it into policy principles, which you then start developing and work interdisciplinarily yes. with people who yes. know how to do policy. Yes, I suppose for me, the concept of legible policy really arose because having now worked in policy, we've I've written and passed two pieces of state legislation around design research that I think have opened up the possibility of 10 million units of housing, which is kind of mind blowing. I'm sure it won't realize that much, but that policy is so illegible. You know, it really, all those kind of codes and regulations are uh, one manifestation of what you might call a public good, right? It's how our collective well-being is managed through legislation. And there isn't any way to understand it for any normal human, right? You, You said study it, you work on it. It takes each of these pieces of legislation that I worked on. I'd say there were 50 people involved in each one and just tracking it was more than my capacities really. Mm -hmm. Um, So how, how is that open to the public? How do people even know what it is that's governing say their ability to build in the world or their, the way in which their physical lives, their material lives are regulated in Mm -hmm. the city. Mm. You know, sometimes you see something like a setback, like a porch. You know that there's some kind of setback rule because nobody's porch goes beyond it. That's a kind of legis- legislative or legible policy. Policy, And trying to figure out how to aim policy so that people understand it, so that they have the chance to build upon it and revise it and mm. um, make use of it is kind of that whole idea. Yeah, Eleanor Ostrom had a similar idea in her talking about co-production, this idea that for co-production to be more likely to occur. And I think that's, a, as architects, possibly as good as we can do, make things more likely to occur. Um, this is the Eleanor Ostrom of the commons. The Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she's amazing. Yeah, um, she wrote a paper in 1996 called Crossing the Great Divide. Um, before she before she won the Nobel Prize, and yes, they right. talked about, I, I should find the quote really, but it's basically she's got these four principles, and one of them is you need to create a uh, a, a basic a mutual policy system whereby it's hackable by both sides. Yes, exactly. So policy, policy needs to be essentially vernacularized so that ordinary people who are already, as you you know, in your example, are already um, building um, pop-up housing for their grandparents in their backyard, right. can 
engage with bureaucratic state policy yeah. yeah and find themselves in a position of not having to live kind of uh, you know and it comes back to this idea of spatial justice if they're having to live sub policy uh, outside policy then they're always vulnerable to policy exactly so th- as a really good example of this very thing that we're doing at City Lab right now at our um what we call our Westlake MacArthur campus where we partner with a community organization called Ola part of Los Angeles an after school program for kids mainly latino kids a lot of immigrant families a lot of first generation kids really bright active urbanists in some ways we started a study called Pathways to Autonomy. It's a very traditional kind of study in this sense. And it shows you how like empirical work and design end up coming together for me and for all of City Lab. So we were looking at like, when is it that a kid walks alone for the first time in Los Angeles? You've probably seen those maps, like your grandfather had a six mile range and your father had a one mile range and you got like three blocks. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of, history of kids autonomy spatial autonomy and for kids who live in these really marginalized and underserved neighborhoods it's pretty dicey walking to and from school and parents who have already two jobs pick their kids up from school and take them to an after school program and then go back to work but at a certain point somewhere between the ages about 11 and 15 these kids start to walk on their own so we followed them around and got them to take photographs and talked to them and had them do photo voice exercises, just showing us what the city was like for them. Mm. And it turned out that they were super smart, had really clear strategies for moving through the city. But they also had were dealing with stuff that had become everyday for them. Trash, uh, basically homeless encampments, um, corners where there were vendors they knew and could gravitate towards bus stops where the buses never stopped, you know, just a range of experiences that really had policy that were tied to policy. Like, why are the streetlights out in their neighborhood? And how do you make that change? Who would know? So we are now training the kids and working with our the different agencies that control the sidewalks for the kids to become their own advocates. The, you know, Department of Transportation had never been able to get the voices of these kids into their registers, Mm. into their city, you know, hearing rooms. And they wanted to know what their experience is. Mm. And the kids didn't have any idea how to get like their complaints about garbage on their paths to the city. So Mm. now they're learning to become their own advocates and also how policy works. And we're setting up a series of uh, sort of, what we're calling micro urban interventions, basically spaces along their route that reflect the kind of urban infrastructure and space that they want. So mm-hmm. they're redesigning their street lights and the bus stops and the fences. And then we'll have those as demonstrations to show the city and the kids will give the city agencies tours of their spaces. So that's emerging. We'll see how successful we are. That's pretty Some- good. You don't want to go against the kids. Um, you mentioned you mentioned yeah. history earlier and and uh, and the historical and sort of engaging with the historical as a way of starting to engage with the present, which I think is a really interesting idea because mm-hmm. I think you know in the the normative way of studying architecture, you look at history. We kind of walk backwards as architects. We're always looking to the past <laughs> and look look at is lo- yeah. endlessly looming. Um, and and a little bit of Mies and a little bit of Frank Lloyd Wright and but Le Corbusier mainly and and I so I would like to understand a little bit how you engage with the historical as a way of of right. leveraging it I suppose to to right. to generate the present or a future. To me, in architecture, the most humanistic part of our discipline is our historical traditions, you know, which have always been really significant in architecture. Maybe I would say that our notion of history is more 
material than cultural or political economic. So there's really wonderful work by Hayden White called The Professional Past and the Practical Past. And I write about this in the Spatial Justice book that really in architecture, we need to develop the practical past in order to understand how it implicates what's going on today and the way we might move going forward. What would that mean? Uh, it means thinking about histories in ways that reflect the lived experiences of our cities, as well as the architectural monuments. So, you know, most of our architectural history texts, even the most recent ones, only deal with monuments. And, you know, there's a lot of city <laughs> and architecture between those monuments. And that, too, has a rich historical uh, lesson and, and I don't know. It's not just lessons. I don't think of history as something that's utilitarian. I don't think we need to think like, how do we use history to, it's really trying to grasp history as the foundation and seeds out of which whatever it is you're seeing now yeah. has grown. And that's the DNA of whatever it is that you're going to be projecting forward. So you just limit yourself so dramatically if you don't think about history in this more fulsome and robust way. Yeah, and it sort of perpetuates the injustice which your book focuses on. Yes. Because, right. you, because you count out all of those voices of those people who didn't get to participate in the production or didn't get represented by the production of monuments. Yeah. Which is which is kind of which is kind of an absurdity, actually. I mean, it's a dis. One couldn't imagine medicine or any other serious discipline mm -hmm. counting out everybody, but the unbelievably rich people that they did surgery on. I mean, kind of where yeah. we've got to. Yes, I think. It, I mean, in some ways, you could say, and this is what's been popping up in medicine now, is that because women were not part of medical laboratories and because you know we experimented on vulnerable populations we've got a perverted medical treatment system also right okay. it's no wonder it's not cures for a lot of women's pathologies but on the other hand in architecture the very thing so, so the very thing that i was saying earlier about the fact that our this comes from hannah rent that our shared reality is the things we can experience together mm -hmm. we've erased histories as we in the united states have erased you know black history uh immigrant history so many you know of the really important populations and contributors and residents of the country over time, all the indigenous, you know, populations, um, then of course we don't share them as a reality. You know, we've mm -hmm. wiped out traces of their cultures to such an extent that, I don't know, you know, when they opened up the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C., people lined up, they asked for contributions and families lined up with the things that they had saved from their black historical past to bring to the museum because we've wiped out the material memory of so much of that mm. you know important part of the american story and certainly of black history so you know architecture seems like the site where even inadvertent histories can be saved. You know, if you mm. look differently, you can see a kind of, you can see some stories that might not be part of the legible past if you look closely enough. And that those stories sit on top of those that have been completely erased, but there's still pieces in many instances that we can start to uncover, which might lead to the next round of discoveries. Fantastic. I don't know if you know the work of Sadia Hartman, but she's a touchstone for me now. Tell me at about her. Tell me about her. Critical fabulation is her historical method, and I've been trying to teach it uh, in our architectural history doctoral program. It's a very 
elaborate method, but it works particularly on erased histories uh, and how you start to build evidence out of literature and um, things that are missing. We in Los Angeles uh, in 1871 um, experienced the worst race riot, a lynching of Chinese residents in the city. They 19 men were lynched on one day just out of a kind of whiskey fueled brawl that most people in Los Angeles knew about at the time. Um, and finding like the names of those men weren't recorded, the you know, stories of their families and their businesses were, were only partially known. So we've been along with the Chinese American community here, and it's really amazing scholars uh, trying to figure out, you know, can we see what the spaces were of that early settlement as a means to understand better what everyday life was like for those individuals who were so violently eliminated from our records. Yeah, for sure. So that's the kind of story of history that, you know, the architecture of that and the things we've found in the archives have been pretty illuminating. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I talk to my daughters about this because they they study history at school and it is always this, well, first of all, it's always a history about war, which is so boring. <laughs> so boring. Unbelievable. I can't believe we're still doing it. Anyway, and there's all of this history that they do miss out. So, uh, you know, when... Uh, you know, I like the history of kings and queens and presidents and yeah. palaces as much as the next person. It's gl- glamorous and it's exciting and and it's um, completely completely made up. But anyway, but but the the other history, the history of what it was like to be, I don't know, just a normal person living in a normal environment, actually would tell us a lot more about our present condition. If they want, if we want history to be to to go back to your comment about useful not really wanting history to be useful but there is a use to it if it helps us kind of situate ourselves in our present and our architectural historiography has failed in that respect in that it's not grounded it's not grounded the culture of architecture in something that's particularly you know it's very strange you go through architectural history you learn these great figures and then you go out and do private domestic extensions it's like (laughs) right what was that what was that? Where's the castle? Where's my castle? Yeah, design? exactly. And and yeah. and you get to the end of your degrees and you think, right, I'm going to go and design me a museum, and there's no museum. And I think you're pointing to a problem though that is really this generation of architects' dilemma, and that is that the discipline and our understanding of it hasn't caught up with the world, and. Yes. To me, that's really what this book is about, is to try to make a practice, a a path of architectural practice that meets new architects, showing them agency in the world they live in today and the one that we're aiming towards moving forwards and giving, finding them agency. You know, I think when I talk to non-architects, the thing that I always start with now is something that isn't commonly held view, which is I really believe in the agency and power of architecture. And I think that should be distributed more broadly. (laughs) Um, Most people, you know, like think that what I do is to try to undermine architecture. I think that's why somebody like Rudofsky has like maybe two paths that come from it. Like one path building out of Radovsky is like, yeah, let's just do the hippie DIY, you know, go for the indigenous thing in Los Angeles. That might be the garage conversion with weekend warriors. You know, I all power to them. What I'm interested in is trying to get architecture as a discipline to bend towards providing and addressing those kind of needs and services. You know, I think that's not impossible. I think that's exactly what our mission should be. What a statement to finish on. Thank you so much, uh, Dana. That was absolutely (laughs) amazing. 
<laughs> Do I sound like a religious zealot? Oh, man. <laughs> I think so. So good. <laughs> Let there, there will be blood. It's like there will be blood all over it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed um, hearing you talk. And it's, an, it's a remarkable book and a remarkable body of work. Thank you. To quote Blaise Pascal, imagination disposes of everything. It creates beauty, justice and happiness, which is everything in this world. Look and see in Dana's great book and say it ain't so. Thanks to her for the conversation and to MIT Press for the book. Links to it and to Dana's social and professional profiles are in the podcast description, as always. Thanks for listening.